Hello and welcome. In this video, we'll automate stock portfolio analysis using Python. We'll fetch stock data, calculate returns, assess portfolio risk, and very interesting, explore how adding new assets can optimize the portfolio using the Sharpe ratio. So let's get started. We are starting by importing the necessary libraries and defining our initial portfolio with four stocks. Apple, Tesla, Microsoft and Google. And here you have the number of stocks. So we have 10 Apple stocks, 5 Tesla stocks, 15 Microsoft stocks and 7 Google stocks. Next, we use Y Finance to fetch historical stock data from January 2023 to January 2024. So let's execute that and take a look at the first few rows of the data. So as you see, we have adjusted closing prices for each stock in our portfolio. And we have daily prices starting in the beginning of 2023. Now that we have fetched the stock data, let's move on to calculating daily returns and analyzing the portfolio performance in part two. First, let's calculate the daily returns for each stock in the portfolio. This helps us see how the value of each stock changes day by day. Next, we calculate the total value of the portfolio by simply multiplying the number of shares by the stock prices and then summing them up. This tells us the portfolio's overall worth. To give you a very simple example, you have a portfolio consisting of two Apple stocks and one Tesla stock. To get the total portfolio worth, you would just take two times Apple price plus one times Tesla price and sum that up to have your portfolio worth. Nothing more is happening here in the total value variable. Next, weights. We calculate the portfolio weights based on the total value. This just shows the proportion of the portfolio that each stock represents. Nothing more than that. So you see portfolio number times portfolio price divided by the total value. Next, we calculate both the portfolio return or the portfolio's expected return and its risk, which is the portfolio volatility here. Starting with the portfolio return, you just take the dot product out of the weights with the mean return. And you multiply that with 252 just to reflect that this is an annualized volatility and return and you have 252 trading days usually in a year. So you can do that, you don't need to do that, but it's a common practice to annualize both returns and volatilities. To get into the mathematical details, I have a whole algebra video on this. I'm not going into details here, but if you want, I can link that in the video description or even better resource is my Python for Finance course where I'm covering that in depth. Moving on to the portfolio volatility, you just take the dot products out of the weights and the covariance metrics and then again take the dot product with the weights and then take the square root to go from portfolio variance to portfolio standard deviation, which is your portfolio volatility. So let's print out both parameters here, portfolio return and portfolio volatility accounting for the risks and see what we are coming up with. So just to reiterate, we have annualized values. So this is 0.54 roughly, and this is 0.22 portfolio volatility. Now that we have the portfolio return and risk, we will compare it to a benchmark like the S&P 500 to see how it stacks up. 
Now we will fetch data for the S&P 500, which we will use as our benchmark to compare against our portfolio's performance. We calculate the daily returns and annualized returns for the S&P 500, which will give us a fair comparison to see how our portfolio performed. Just like we did with the portfolio, we will calculate the S&P 500's volatility as well and annualize that. This will tell us how much the benchmark fluctuates and helps us assess the portfolio's risk compared to the market. So let's execute that. And you see the benchmark return is slightly lower than the portfolio return and the benchmark volatility is slightly lower than the portfolio volatility. So less return, but also less risk here to summarize. Finally, we'll visualize the portfolio's performance compared to the S&P 500. So we'll accumulate the returns of the portfolio by taking the cumulative products and multiply that with the weights. And we do the same for the benchmark as we don't have multiple assets here. We just take the cumulative product and don't need to take any weights into account. Then we will plot. So this is a simple line plot. As you see, I pass the portfolio cumulative index here and the portfolio cumulative values, give it a label and a color. And for the bench benchmark, same story just the cumulative benchmark, some uh, data labels here. And finally, I'm plotting it. So if I'm triggering or pulling the trigger here, you will see that I have my portfolio versus the benchmark S&P 500. And what you see, just to chat a bit about how this can make sense, you see that the portfolio is moving very, very similar to the benchmark. What, if you think about it, makes sense because we have some major assets from the S&P 500 in our portfolio. So you see that the return is way higher, but you see that it's also moving stronger than the benchmark. That's quite nice to see here how these assets, so Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, and Google, have an impact on the S&P 500. What we compared is the portfolio performance with the S&P 500. And now we want to see, and that's the, in my viewpoint, the most interesting part, how adding new assets to our portfolio can improve the portfolio by calculating sharp ratios. Now, the most exciting part, adding new assets. We will begin by fetching historical stock data for new potential assets like Netflix, Amazon, and Nvidia as an example. Then we are again calculating returns on these potential assets. And then we combine the returns of the current portfolio with the returns of the new assets or asset because we are looping over all potential assets. But this is just one iteration on each asset. We'll adjust the portfolio weights and assign 90% of the total portfolio weight to the existing assets and the remaining 10% will be allocated to the new asset. So the assumption is you buy 10% of the new asset. This way, the total weight remains at 100%. After adjusting the weights, we are recalculating the portfolio's expected return and also the portfolio's volatility. This will show us how the addition of the new asset affects both the performance and the risk of the portfolio. Finally, we calculate the Sharpe ratio for each potential new asset. The Sharpe ratio tells us how much extra return we get for the additional risk we are taking. 
means the asset with the highest Sharpe ratio is the one that optimizes the portfolio's risk return balance. Why subtracting minus 0.03 here? That is just accounting for the risk free rate. You can skip that part so you don't necessarily have to do that as the risk free rate at the moment is quite significant. I would integrate it. I just took a proxy here of 3%. Always depends where you are, but should be a fine proxy for the US here. So let's execute that and actually see what that turns out here. So the best asset to add to our portfolio would be NVIDIA with a Sharpe ratio of 2.57. So if you wanna check the Sharpe ratios, which you filled within this loop here, you can just check. So all have quite high Sharpe ratios, but NVIDIA is the top one, which is honestly, if you followed along the NVIDIA journey, not a surprising result here. To recap, we started by setting up the portfolio and calculating its expected return and risk compared it to the S&P 500 benchmark. Then we optimized the portfolio by adding a new asset. By selecting the asset with the highest Sharpe ratio, we've improved the portfolio's overall performance, increasing returns while managing risks. That's it for today. Thanks a lot for watching and I'm looking forward to see you in the upcoming videos. Bye-bye.